I can see that you truly believe in Christianity and you are very convincing. But Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, and Mormons are equally devout and convincing. So why should I believe you? Okay, this is the problem of competing religious claims. The problem of competing religious claims. In witnessing to somebody or answering their objections to Christianity, you may get them to the place where they're saying, well, there must be a God. I see that now. And the objections I had from evil and so forth, they aren't really logical, they're psychological. But then, how do I know it's your God rather than the Muslim God? Or how do I know that a cult like the Mormons is not correct rather than like you Protestants with your Bible and things of that nature? And for many people, that has seemed to be the most difficult problem in apologetics. How do we make Christianity stand out from the rest? Okay. Now I'm going to give you a short answer and a long answer. And the short answer is very important. You probably will not appreciate how powerful the short answer is, though, and that's why I'll give you the long answer, too. But the short answer is, I have not been defending a God. That's short enough? Okay, now the long answer. No, no, no. The short answer. I have not been defending the idea that there is a God. What have I been defending? I have been defending a very specific concept of God. That is to say, I've been defending the biblical God. My arguments have had nothing to do with what we might call generic theism. You all know what generic things are? Probably in the grocery store back home, you have generic products, don't you? You, you can buy this brand of tea or that brand of tea, or you can buy generic tea, right? There's a little blue line some places, or it's just a white box with red lettering or something. It just looks very plain. That's just generic tea. People will often fall into the mistake of trying to defend generic theism. Just the idea that there's a God somewhere of some character. But in every one of the answers that I've given you thus far, and I trust if I'm faithful in all that I'll give you in this conference... I'm not going to be defending anything generic. I'm always defending and only defending Christian theism, which is to say biblically defined theism. And the reason I'm emphasizing this in terms of the short answer is you have to understand that it's only the biblical God, only the God who reveals himself in the scriptures that provides a worldview that is not arbitrary, inconsistent, have consequences that anybody would want to get rid of, and provides the preconditions of intelligibility. All the other concepts of God, all the other religions, including the Christian cults, do not do that. So you have to be kind of careful. Many times, if you're witnessing to somebody on campus, or you know, you're in the cafeteria and having a talk, there might be a friend who comes along that's, uh, say, a Mormon, will sit down, and this Mormon wants to, you know, kind of chime in with you. And this Mormon likes, in abstract or in general terms, what you're saying. So the Mormon say, yeah, we stand together on this. And you need to, in a polite and kind way, not sarcastic and cutting, but you need to say, no, we don't stand together on this. I am not defending the Mormon concept of God. Or if you have, um, to say, a Muslim friend, you uh, are sitting down as a Christian with your Muslim friend, and the two of you are talking to an atheist. And it may appear that you and the Muslim, see, we side, you know, we're buddies here for a while. Because we want this atheist to admit he's wrong and that we are generally right. There is a God. And then after we get to that step, we take another step and talk about now who's, you know, got the right idea of this God. Is it Jehovah or is it Allah? That is not the proper approach to apologetics. Apologetics is a comparison of worldviews, not an abstract, not generically, but very specifically and in detail. The only worldview that I defend is the biblically defined worldview. It's only Christian theism that I defend. 
So now when somebody comes along and asks a question similar to what's on this card, say, well, how, how do you know that it's yours rather than the Muslim? I'll say, the only one I've been defending is mine. Okay, but then the Muslim's going to say, I've got a worldview too. And I've got a revelation too. And I've got an absolute personal God too. And so now how are we going to choose between them? Anybody have any ideas what we might want to look at in the Muslim approach, Islam? Like, like maybe whether it's arbitrary and full of inconsistencies, what its consequences are and whether it provides the preconditions of intelligibility. You see, we get misled. And by the way, there are schools of apologetics who look at presuppositionalism, and they don't understand this either, because they think, oh yeah, well that, that'll work real good with an atheist, but it won't do any good when it comes to competing revelations. Well, sure it will. Because we're going to evaluate these competing revelations on the same basis. You have to understand, I don't believe that Christianity, you know, uh, is, how can I say this, conforms to what we're looking at on the board here, just because I say so. Christians make claims. People say, that's just arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. God revealed that. Oh, well, it's full of inconsistencies. Show me one. Well, the Trinity. And then you go to show how the early churches defined the Trinity in a way that's not inconsistent, so forth. Well, what about the consequences? Of course, we do real well on that. Unless somebody looks at the consequences of what is hypocrisy and a violation of God's law, and you should remember this. When people point out, well, Christians have lived in a terrible way, blah, blah, blah. You know, they, they killed those witches in Salem, or people who claim to be witches. People bring that up, I always want to say, but don't you see, it's the Bible that enables us to condemn the, uh, the killing of innocent people who claim to be witches. And so the, it's not the Bible that you should be angry with, but those people claiming to follow the Bible, and they weren't. Those hypocrites or those people being disobedient. Anyway, the consequences is something we're glad to look at. And then the preconditions of intelligibility. The Christian story, if I can put it that way, and I don't mean it's a you know, fabricated myth or something, but if you just look at the Christian explanation of this world and of human life and what's wrong with us and how we can get right with God, so forth, the Christian story will make sense out of logic and will make sense out of science, will make sense out of morality will make sense out of human dignity, will make sense out of the ability of the human mind to know the world outside of it, will make sense of human community, and on and on. And so we can ask those same questions now when somebody comes and says, oh, well, I've got my own God, my own revelation. You want to say, okay, is this arbitrary? Are there inconsistencies in it? What are the consequences? And does it finally provide the preconditions of intelligibility? So we come to the question of competing religions. You can evaluate competing religions in the same way you evaluate atheism. That's the point of the short answer. Now the long answer. It turns out, I'd rather leave this on the board. I'm not going to put this outline up. You can cut the cake different ways. And if you read a book, or if you choose yourself to outline it differently, you won't offend me. Um, but I, I've done this for a while, and I found this helpful. Maybe you will as well. I would suggest you can divide all of the religions and cults of the world into three groups. Into three groups. And the reason I'm doing this is if you learn how to refute a member of group one, a member of group two, a member of group three, that same technique will be helpful then for the other members of the group that we don't have time to, to touch on at this conference. You all understand the method here? I'm going to illustrate how to deal with three different kinds of religious uh, competition or competitors and from that, I hope you'll pick up some tools for dealing with others in those classes as well. What are the three classes? First of all, if you look out there, you'll find religions of transcendent mysticism. Transcendent mysticism. And I mean by this, as a broad category, those religions that put their emphasis on that which goes beyond human experience 
and as such can only be contacted in a supra-rational or mystical way. There are religions that emphasize transcendent mysticism. Um, one of the best examples is the world religion Hinduism and all of its variants, all the denominational you know, uh, differences between the Hindus. According to the Hindu, Brahman, God, is everything. But, of course, it doesn't appear that way to us, and so we have to understand that Brahman goes beyond our experience and beyond our rationality. And the only way you can get right with God, which is the all, is through mystical contemplation, yoga, and finally the enlightenment that comes. Okay? And there are religions that have that kind of stress. It's all very mysterious. It's, it's beyond our rationality. Okay, now what is the first problem that you're going to have with anybody who says, my religion is beyond human rationality, beyond human experience? You're going to say, well, then how do you know about it? If it's beyond rationality and beyond human experience, then there's nothing you could possibly tell me about it. Because anything you would try to tell me would have to be rational, and it would have to be based on your experience. And therefore, if you're making these kind of mystical claims, they are going to be arbitrary. When somebody who has a mystical religion says, well, this is what you need to do to be right with the oneness of being, you can come up with a different alternative. So I know, I think eating hot fudge sundaes is what makes us right with the oneness of being. You say, oh no, but that isn't what the sages of old said. And you say, well, but so what? They have their opinion, I have mine. Why should I listen to them rather than me? or you, whatever. Let's look at Hinduism in particular. The Hindu tells us that the problems in this world stem from our seeing things as discrete and separate from one another. Because Brahman, the ultimate reality, God, if you will, is everything, there are no distinctions, therefore, and when we draw such distinctions, then we are not seeing reality for what it really is. And so, in this world, this world of maya, illusion, we walk around drawing distinctions, saying there's really two things, or 30 things, or a thousand things, when in fact there's only one thing. Now, the Beatles went through a phase in their music, in their lyrics, when they were interested in Eastern mysticism, a more or less Hindu approach to life. You know, and you, you hear things in there about turning off your mind and floating downstream. It is not dying. In fact, uh, you are me and I am you and we are all together. No differences between us. There's, I never knew the Beatles to hold that philosophy when someone tried to take their wallet out of the room. But nevertheless, if they were living up to their religious convictions at that point, they would have said everything is the same. There are no distinctions. There's no difference between you and me. And there's no difference between us and the trees and the lakes and the, and the skies and so forth. All is one. Now when you live in this world, it's hard to see that. And that's why you have to meditate. You go through the yoga. And eventually, you'll be enlightened. And when you are enlightened, you will enter into nirvana. At that point, according to Hinduism, then the drop of water that represents you as an individual will be spliced back into the shoreless ocean of being. The shoreless ocean of being. So there are no distinctions, there's no beginning, no end, and you are, you know, you're now part of that, and you draw no more distinctions. Okay. Now the amazing thing is, for something which is supposed to be mystical and beyond human rationality and beyond human experience, there's a whole lot of sentences that were used in human language to explain that, weren't there? That should make you suspicious right away. And say, well, how can you say that? Listen closely. People who don't study world religions have this really stupid idea. Well, the answer is, you Christians have a revelation, the Hindus have a revelation. It's called the Bhagavad Gita. But you have to look at what the worldview says. 
On the Christian story, there is a personal God who created the world, sovereignly controls all things, who can reveal himself in language, even written in a book. That story may be true, may be false, but at least the story hangs together. It comports with itself. The Bhagavad Gita cannot be a personal revelation of God because God is not personal in Hinduism. The Bhagavad Gita cannot be made an analogy to the Bible. In a formal sense, they're both, quote, religious books because people acting religiously read them. But what the Bible claims to be is nothing at all like what the Bhagavad Gita claims to be. So when people give you all these sentences describing Hinduism, you have the right to say, how do you know that? You're just being arbitrary. God didn't tell you that. Oh, yes, Brahman revealed this through the great philosophers of our religion. Brahman revealed it? That's a personal statement about a being that you're telling me is not personal. Or even worse, Let's look at those sentences, and those of you who've been to our conference before have heard this refutation. I always enjoy it because it's so easy to do. If I run into, a, say, a Hare Krishna, one of the versions of Hindu thought at the airport, and the Hare Krishna goes through all of this stuff and he says, you know, you're not in nirvana. You're in this world of maya. You are on the wheel of life. And if you don't get things right, you'll be reincarnated. You'll have to go through this again until you finally get enlightenment. Then you can enter nirvana. I always say, now, let me just see if I can tell this story back to you. If I got this right, the, the real problem in my life and in this world is that we draw these artificial distinctions. When, in fact, the ultimate reality is one, we see many things. And we shouldn't draw those distinctions. He says, yes. He thinks, boy, I almost have a convert here. And I say, and I haven't entered into nirvana yet because I keep drawing these distinctions and I need to be enlightened and to give up that way of thinking. Yes, that's exactly right. I draw the conclusion, well, then I am already in nirvana. No, you're not, because you're still here in this world that sees things in an illusory way. I say, no, wait a minute. When you say that, you're assuming there's a distinction between maya and nirvana. And if there's a distinction between maya and nirvana, then you're wrong that ultimate reality has no distinctions. And some of you are wondering, is that the end of the lecture? That's the end of it. Because the Hindu has just given you the rope by which you hang him. If you listen to the story, it's arbitrary and it's got inconsistencies. Or another, well, we'll get to the preconditions in just a second. If there are no distinctions, then I must already be in nirvana because there can't be a difference between nirvana and anything else. Everything is nirvana. Or you could say everything is maya or everything is samsara. If everything is one ultimately, then it makes no sense to even have a sentence that distinguishes one word from another. Now, I'll, I'm not making this up. I'm not making it easy on myself. You will then have Hindus tell you things like this. Well, that's your problem, Dr. Bonson. You're committed to this Western logic. And so you found an inconsistency in our theology, and you think you're so smart but our theology is, what did I tell you? Transcendent, it is mystical, it is beyond logic. And that's at this point that we're now dealing with the preconditions of intelligibility. And I say to the Hindu, well, if you tell me that your religion does not follow the laws of logic, then I tell you that it does. Sound familiar? A few days ago we went into this. Somebody who says, I reject logic. Okay, if a person rejects logic, they have no right to insist on consistency then, do they? Anybody who rejects logic says, this is permissible. P, and it is not the case that P. Both of those are permissible if you reject logic. So when somebody tells me, I reject logic, if he really does, then it is permissible for me to contradict him. And here's the contradiction I choose. You say you reject logic, then I'll affirm that you don't reject logic. 
And on your view, you can't say, "Uh uh-uh, that contradicts what I said. Contradicts? Well, that's resting on what? Logic. Okay, so this is like three different layers now dealing with Hinduism. I hope you can see the Hindu religious option is no competition if you wish to be rational. I will grant you, there will be people who will say, well then if I have to give up rationality to be a Hindu, so be it. And then you'll say, well, if you, if you give up rationality, you don't. And then they'll say, okay, I won't talk to you then. So then you can't refute me. <laughs> the best defense is not to say anything. But you say from a Christian standpoint, and I mean this sincerely and tenderly, from the Christian standpoint, even if the person doesn't want to talk, they're not inaccessible to God. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't worry about the fact that they've closed their mouths. God can still reach them. And I'll say, well, you're going to have to think logically even though you won't say anything. No, I'll become insane rather than be a Christian. <laughs> well, remember, I mean, I'm interested in the conversion of the individual, but from an apologetical standpoint, honoring Christ and the truthfulness of His Word, when a person says, I'd rather be insane, or I'd rather give up the laws of logic, all you want to say is speak up into the microphone, please. Because that's just another way of declaring the only way to be rational is to be a Christian. And that's what we're trying to show. And if somebody says, well, then I don't wish to be rational because I hate God so much, we'll say, well, you know, in a sense, that's very consistent of you, you inconsistent person. Because what you're saying is your heart is so much in rebellion against God that you don't want to be rational if it requires Christianity. Okay, religions of transcendent mysticism. The second category in world religions and cults would be a category um, that I call religions of eminent moralism. Eminent is the opposite of transcendent. By the way, there are two spellings of what we say when we use the word eminent. This is I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T rather than I-N. We're not talking about the eminence of somebody like a movie star, but eminence means it has emanated or it's near at hand. It's close to or part of human experience. There are some world religions that don't emphasize what goes beyond human experience, but rather what's here and now and part of our detailed experience or our daily experience. And those religions prove to be not so much mystical, like the Hindu, Hare Krishna, and other sorts, but moralistic religions. And a good example here would be Confucianism or Buddhism. Okay? Confucius was not, I mean, Confucius asserted something that he thought was transcendent, TN, the heavens. But even at that, as you can tell, the heavens are not as transcendent as Brahman, which is beyond all categorization and words and so forth. And the emphasis in Confucianism is not upon uh, ritual, meditation, uh, mysticism and so forth, but upon living in a certain way. And so you all know the Analects of Confucius. Confucius say, okay, and so the, the man, the noble man in Confucian religion, the noble man lives in a certain way. He, he protects the face of his neighbor, which is a way of saying he does not publicly shame people. He is courteous, on and on and on. And so there are plenty of religions like that. And by the way, that is the most devastating refutation of religions of eminent moralism. There's so many of them. How is that a refutation? Let's say somebody, you know, is arguing with you, you're a Christian, and you say, well, Jesus tells me to do X, Y, Z. The other person says, well, I don't follow Jesus, I follow Confucius. And Confucius say, A, B, C. We have every right to say, well, What authority does Confucius have? Now you're all sitting there thinking, well, there's got to be more. No, don't you understand? That's the end of it. So Confucius said this. I don't mean to sound sarcastic, but quite honestly, big deal. Who's Confucius? Okay, now the Confucian person says, okay, this is a reversible argument. So then who's Jesus? And you say he's the Son of God, and he would be the judge of all mankind. 
well, I don't have to accept that. And you say, well, you may not accept that, but you have to understand that in terms of the Christian story, it makes sense to say Jesus is our moral authority. But in terms of your view of the universe, where TN, the heavens, control all things, so what? What's so special about Confucius? He was especially wise. Now, are you going to be fooled by that? The next question is, and who says so? Who was the person who had a contest, like about zucchini and its proper use, said, I want all the wise people, all the guys who think they're wise, to come forward, and I'll judge you, and then I'll determine who's the wisest of all. And even if there were such a contest, the next question would be, and how do you know who's the wisest of all? These eminent religions that don't have a transcendent authority to appeal to, that which goes beyond human experience, that's what we have as Christians. The creator of heaven and earth says, Jesus is my son, this is my beloved son, hear him. Jesus says, no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son reveals him. Now, you may reject that as not being true, and then there are consequences for that rejection, both intellectual and spiritual and eternal and so forth. But at least it makes sense to say everyone's supposed to bow the knee to Jesus in terms of the Christian story. But in the Confucian story or the Buddhist story, who cares what uh, the Buddha said? Why should I listen to Buddha? Because he's the enlightened one. Well, and how do I know that he's the enlightened one rather than Confucius? Okay? Or Garth in Wayne's World. And I've always thought there was a real religious, you know, solemnity and special character to that guy. There's no way to judge. It, it proves to be arbitrary. Um, there are a number of inconsistencies in these religions, but you know I can't give you a survey of all of them at this point, so maybe I'll give you one or two. Most moralistic faiths will tell you that the problem that men have individually and corporately is that they don't live up to a particular code. Okay, and they will say that all men fail to live up to that code. Okay, let's just take their story as far as they tell it. If it's true that all men fail to live up to that code, then there must be something wrong with men, right? If there's something wrong with men, then they're going to need some help to get out of trouble. I'm being very vague on purpose here, very abstract. I want you to see the problem's the same in all moralistic cults. If man is guilty because he hasn't followed the code, the question is, first, how are you going to change man so that now he'll start following the code? If you grant that all mankind's got this problem, then you need something like what we call redemption, deliverance. But moralistic faiths don't have redemption. You know what they put in the place of redemption? Try harder to follow the code. There is no hope in moralistic faiths. You say, well, okay, I, I've broken all the rules that Confucius gives. What should I do to become a noble person? Well, start living by the rules. But don't you see, my previous problem was that I was breaking the rules. What's going to make me a person that can now keep the rules? No answer. But it's worse than that. If the problem is that you were breaking the rules previously, even if tomorrow morning, somehow, miraculously, without explanation, you could now live up to all the rules for the rest of your life, the guilt of your past transactions would not have been dealt with. Moralistic faiths not only fail to deal with the human problem, they cannot bring it about that people who are lawbreakers can now become law keepers. They can't deal with the guilt of past law breaking. And so there are these internal contradictions or inadequacies in all moralistic faiths, eminent faiths as well. Well, let's, let's move on quickly here to the third category. We have, first of all, religions of transcendent mysticism. Got to get my mouth to work. Secondly, religions of eminent moralism. Thirdly, you have religions that are counterfeits of Christianity. 
And um, like I say, I've taught this and debated this for a number of years, and I find this a helpful way to break it down. Hinduism isn't aping Christianity. Buddhism, Confucianism, they don't ape Christianity. But there are a number of religions which in one way or another are counterfeits of Christianity. And now within that third category, we don't want anyone nodding off here because I have jalapeno peppers to throw at you. Tomorrow we graduate to zucchinis. That will really hurt. Within that third category of counterfeits of Christianity, you have three subdivisions. You have polytheistic perversions of Christianity, Unitarian perversions of Christianity, and thirdly, pseudo-messianic perversions of Christianity. That is where the main error in the first case is that this alleged version of Christianity is polytheistic. In the second case, the the perversion is a rejection of the Trinity. You have but one person that is God. You have Unitarian perversions of Christianity. And then thirdly, you have uh, the main problem in the religion being a false messiah or or, um, some person or rule or being of some sort that takes the place of Jesus in a deliverance function. As illustrations, in the first category, a polytheistic perversion of Christianity is Mormonism. This may surprise some of you. It surprises Mormons who come to my door. I kid you not. I have often, when they come, I always invite them in. Sure, I'd love to talk about religion. come on in, can you stay a while? <laughs> and they'll sit down, you know, you always let them speak first, give their nice little spiel, and I'll say, well, but, but I have problems with, with you, you, you all are Mormons, right? You forgot to mention that, but that's okay. Okay, you're Mormons. I, the problem I have is this idea that there are many gods. And I've actually had, on a number of occasions, people say, we don't believe that. I'll say, well, sure, you do. No, we don't believe that. I said, well, excuse me, I'm going to get my Book of Mormon. Come back. I said, and don't you also hold to the, uh, the Pearl of Great Price? Oh, you do, okay. And the Doctrines and the Covenant? Okay, okay. Go and get their three big books, you know. I mean, big in the sense of authoritative books. And then you point out all these polytheistic passages. Now, this is shameful because I'm doing their homework for them. But I want you to know... Mormonism, according to its own authoritative documents, teaches there are many gods. I remember one, um, uh, two girls, two young ladies that uh, came by and were shocked when I said that. And I pointed it out and they said, well, we're going to go ask about that. We'll be back. I said, please, do come back. And they did come back in a couple of weeks. And then they came in as though that, you know, this is some great revelation and this solved the problem. They said, okay, well, we do believe there are many gods, but there's only one God for this universe. (laughs) Well, big deal. So there's only one God. That's, by the way, called henotheism. The idea that you worship only one God, but there are many out there. And all sorts of problems with polytheism can be brought up. But you need to know that um, Mormons often are not even aware of their own theology. Okay, now... Somebody is going to ask the question, in fact, someone did ask the question, well, then why, we accept the Bible, why don't we accept the Book of Mormon? Okay. Let's ask, what do Mormons say the relationship is between the Bible and the Book of Mormon? Do they reject the Bible? Some of you may already know. No, they do not reject the Bible. They say that God revealed all these books that we consider biblical, and that A number of years later, Jesus made a revelation of himself to the Indians of North America, and and from this we get the Book of Mormon. So they see the Book of Mormon as an additional revelation to the Bible. Okay, what does the Bible tell us then is the judge or the standard of judgment for additional revelation. That is, since they grant the Christian worldview 
that is in, they'll say it in words. Ultimately, they don't really. But since they will say the Bible is authoritative, you say, okay, well, then we can look at the Bible for the standards of additional revelations as they come. And one of those standards is further revelation cannot contradict what God has said previously. If a prophet comes to you and he says, follow after other gods that you have not known and so forth, or as the apostles say, if somebody comes to you and says that Jesus is, uh, that the Messiah has not come in the flesh and so forth, then you're to reject that fur alleged further revelation. So this is a biblical standard. They say they're committed to the Bible. That means they are committed to judging the Book of Mormon by previous revelation. You all with me? So now all you need to do is show that Mormon theology in the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, and so forth, is in conflict with the Bible. A good place to start is whether there's one God or many, by the way. And there are any number of other things, because this always happens, time is short, I can't give you all the illustrations I might. But you go through and show contradictions. By the way, Mormons believe some rather strange things, not just that there are many gods, Some of you are chuckling. Maybe you've already heard some of the things they believe. You, do you realize that Mormons believe that Adam was a god? Adam, as he walked in the garden, was our god. So when you point out these contradictions, what you have done is on their own terms, you have refuted the Book of Mormon as a revelation of God. Now, you're probably thinking, they're not going to sit down and take that just that easily, Dr. Bonson. And no, they aren't. Because now you're going to find out that what they meant when they said they accept the Bible is they mean they accept the Bible as it's properly interpreted and translated. And when the Bible is properly interpreted and translated, then they say it is consistent with the further revelations like the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price. Now what are we going to do? You're going to say, well, how do we know that you have a proper translation of the Bible? You need to ask Mormons for documentary evidence for their translation of the Bible. Because you have to understand, it's not a matter of how you take a particular Greek or Hebrew word here and there. Their rewriting of the Bible is... Pretty amazing. In Genesis 3, in the Mormon Bible, Satan offers to God to redeem mankind. That doesn't look like just the semantic difference on a few words in Hebrew. That looks like somebody's added something to the story. In Genesis 6, Adam is baptized by immersion in the Mormon Bible. Again, I don't think that's just the translation of a few Hebrew words. Something gives here. Um, there's a long prophecy by Enoch given in the book of Genesis that we don't have in our book of Genesis at all. We learn in the Mormon Bible that man's ability to propagate sexually rests on his fall into sin. That's why men are now able to, to make babies. And amazingly, in the 50th chapter of Genesis in the Mormon Bible, we have a prediction of the appearance of someone called Joseph Smith. <laughs> well, I think it's a little understatement to, to say, isn't that a little too convenient? <laughs> and so you're going to have to say, we need some manuscript evidence for this. You know how much they will give you? Exactly zero. There is no manuscript evidence for this. They will say that the Book of Mormon must be trusted because the prophet of God, Joseph Smith, gave it and if he endorsed this translation, then you must endorse it as well. That is the translation of what you call the Bible. Well, so let's ask about the Book of Mormon then. You all know the story of the Book of Mormon? What is the Book of Mormon? What was it like? Well, it was written according to Mormons, according to the book itself in chapter 9, verse 32, in Reformed Egyptian. The language of Reformed Egyptian. Now, we as scholars of language, don't have any examples reformed Egyptian. 
And so we've got to take their word for it, that it was written in a language that no one else knows about. Now, in chapter 9, verse 33, we read that Hebrew would have been a more perfect script to write the Book of Mormon on these plates, but the plates were not large enough for the Hebrew script. And so it had to be done in Reformed Egyptian. Of course, that that does make you kind of ask, why didn't God make the plates bigger? So that he could have used the more perfect language of Hebrew that other people could have read. We have no record of writing on metal plates from antiquity, yet they claim the entire Old Testament was once put on brass plates about 600 B.C. Many changes have been made in the Book of Mormon after its original translation, although Mormons tell you that it was translated infallibly and inerrantly. Joseph Smith did the translation with the umum and thumum, or so we're told. But we don't know what the Urmum and Thummim were in the Old Testament. And he did it behind a sheet, and no one could watch him. He called out these things, and his friend was supposed to write them down. Now, Mormons will tell you they were written down, and then the plates were taken with the translation to an expert, Dr. Anton in New York, so that he could confirm the Reformed Egyptian translation. Now, Dr. Anton, when he heard they were making these claims swore that it never took place, and he never said that, and he said there is no such thing as Reformed Egyptian. Well, chapter 9, verse 34 of Mormon says that no other person on earth knows Reformed Egyptian. (laughs) Well, if no other person on earth knows it, how could Dr. Anton have done what he was said to have done? You see, the story just doesn't hang together. There's all this arbitrariness and inconsistency and so forth. And so, it comes down to this. Mormons will tell you, I've had this happen many times as they're at the door getting ready to leave. Well, I just trust Joseph Smith, and if you pray about it, you will too. Does that sound subjective to you? In the end, the refutation which is biblical, the refutation which is internal, their inconsistencies, the refutation that comes from their own false claims, they finally want to override that with, but I've got faith in Joseph Smith. And so now... The final thing you need to know about Joseph Smith is we have the court records from this. Joseph Smith was convicted in Bainbridge, New York, before he became the prophet of God, of glass looking. You ever heard that expression? You know what a glass looker is? In the 1800s, there were people, charlatans, what we today call con men, who went around putting a glass, a rounded piece of glass, in a hat or something, putting his face in the hat and claiming to see buried treasure or where a well could be found or something like that. And some people were stupid enough to pay him to do that sort of thing. And finally, he was brought to court and convicted of being a con man. And so when Mormons are leaving, having said, okay, there are all these problems, but if Joseph Smith is the prophet of God, you need to trust him, then I finally say, yes, and you need to know that before he became the prophet of God, he was a convicted con man. So you have your choice. All of the religions of the world, whether they are religions of transcendent mysticism, eminent moralism, or they are somehow counterfeits of Christianity, will fall subject to these problems that I've been teaching you. Now, to deal with particular ones, you have to study those particular religions. But the method that I've taught you will be usable in every one of